I had an epiphany when I was 12 years old, when I was watching a French film in black and white with English subtitles with my dad on one of his trips with his baseball team. And when I saw this film, it was so intense because it had a sad ending. It was about a 12-year-old boy who was being beat by his stepfather and bullied by his teachers, and he was beginning to drift into petty crime. And the film ended with a dead end. And I decided at that moment that I wanted to be a filmmaker. So at 12 years old, people say to you, well, what kind of films do you want to make? And I said, I want to make films to have a powerful emotional contact with my audience. And the funny thing is, is that 50 years later, the animation that I'm making is having the most powerful connection with kids that I could imagine. Now, <clears throat> in my 20s, I decided that I wasn't going to be a filmmaker, that I would shift to animation for two reasons. One is because I had more control, and two is because animation knows no borders. It's easily consumable in all race, religion, culture, and creed worldwide. And American animators have created a language which the world is open to immediately. If you ask any taxi driver in the world today what their favorite cartoon character is, and they're going to say Tom and Jerry, right? <laughs> and those are my favorite. When I'm growing up, those are my favorite cartoon characters. I love Tom and Jerry. I love the Looney Tunes. I love the Tex Avery wacky cartoons with Droopy Dog and Screwy Squirrel. But the irony is, is that 10 years ago, because networks go through phases, SpongeBob SquarePants and other cartoon anarchy films that kids love put our shows, The Rugrats and Wild Thornberries, out of business because we had our moment with our Family of Values animation and then it shifted. But every crisis is an opportunity. And my dad, who I was visiting on a family reunion, said to me, listen, here's the challenge. I want you to stop using cartoons to sell Happy Meals and toys to kids. Well, I want you to work with your sister, who's a special needs teacher in Denver, on telling stories in the classroom to model appropriate behavior because she's having such a tough time. So I sat down with my sister and we began writing out one-minute scripts for simple behaviors like don't talk when the teacher's talking or keep your hands to yourself or use your inside voice. And it worked. So um, over the last three years with our company, we actually have produced 200 of these social-emotional learning cartoons. And, um, and we're having great success. And I'd like to just show you an, an excerpt from one of them in which we help model the process of when you're stuck in a lie as a little one, how to get out of it. Let's take a look at the clip. This was my favorite truck. Now what am I going to play with? Chris, you told a lie. You shouldn't do that. I, I didn't mean to. I just don't want Peter to be mad at me. But you are his best friend. <clears throat> If you tell him the truth and tell him you are sorry, he won't be mad. But if you lie, he will be. You're right. But telling the truth can be hard. And now my tummy hurts and my head feels funny. I think that's the truth trying to get out. Go tell Peter the truth about what happened to his truck. <sighs> okay. So why do cartoons work so well with children under the age of third grade? If they still believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy, they want to think that cartoon characters are real. So in preschool, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, it's a great way to use age-appropriate characters to model behavior. So as I was out sharing my animations with superintendents, there was a visionary superintendent named Dr. Mort Sherman who saw what I had and he introduced me to doctors Art Costa and Ben Akalik, who are the creators of the Global Institute for Habits of Mind. And we had an instant attraction for what we were both trying to do, and, and we sat down and we agreed to animate the 16 Habits of Mind. And, you know, students who are loved at home go to school to learn. And students who don't have 
the opportunity to be loved at home for so many reasons, go to school to be loved. And a lot of time in these overcrowded classrooms, teachers do their best, but they can't get to every single child in the room. So we're infusing our lessons with a loving way in which the characters t talk to one another. And if you want to stop bullying, it's our philosophy that you get to children in preschool and kindergarten when they're first being socialized and model empathy so that when they are confronted with that moment in time which they're witnessing bullying or they're being bullied or they might think about bullying, they have empathy for the character who is the recipient of that behavior. So let's take a brief look at an excerpt from our listening with understanding, the understanding and empathy habit of mind. Peter? <clears throat> oh, hi. I'm sorry I didn't understand how you felt before. I'm just really disappointed about my soccer game. My grandpa was there watching me and I really wanted him to see me win. It wasn't just any game. This game was special. Mm. What happened? I missed the last goal. And my team lost. Oh, you wanted your grandpa to be proud of you winning. But you lost. I understand. You're sad because you feel like you let him down. Yeah, you do understand. And it feels good that you empathize with me. Thank you. <laughs> so we feel that we need to prepare children for the four R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and reality. Because the challenges that we're faced today is that if they don't enter third grade being proficient in reading, writing, and arithmetic, they're going to have a hard time navigating the journey through middle school and high school and graduation. And the reality that distracts them from the success are all, is all the noise that exists outside the classroom. Because there's 168 hours in a week. Typically, kids are sleeping 56 of those hours, and they have 40 hours in the classroom. They have 72 hours of free time. And research shows that children today are spending 53 to 62 hours of those 72 hours on a device. That's a lot to compete with. Um, but what we need to do is teach them the fundamentals at an early age. And my dad was a Hall of Fame coach at Cornell where they don't have scholarships for athletes. So I asked my dad, so what's the secret to your success? And he said, I worked on fundamentals over and over and over again on the off-season and during practice so that when we got in the game, we operated on instinct better than our competition. And we think that teaching these fundamentals is imperative to children in preschool, kindergarten, first grade, and second grade when they're first being socialized. And the quiet zone for this opportunity is in school, and in after-school programs at the Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA and libraries and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, any place where there's an adult interfacing with children so they can play the two-minute, three-minute short, and then it's not the end of the conversation, it's the beginning of the conversation. And then that needs to be systematically re repeated over the next four years so that when they get in the game, somebody offers them a gateway drug in junior high school or in high school, or they're in the car and they receive a text and they put themselves at danger and everybody else on the freeway in danger, that they manage their impulsivity and they think about it because they're fundamentally sound and they're operating on a strong instinct. So we've taken this one step further. We're, we're successful with the habits of mind. We're getting a great response. But there's other distractions in reality that are helping to hold a child back from succeeding in school. It's um, living in an addicted home, um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, hunger. So we're working with organizations to use our animated characters to model behavior in, the, in a different way, but in a similar fashion, so that we can take complicated ideas and make them simple. So let's watch this short montage. Hi there, I'm Sarah, and I have a story to tell you. It's kind of hard to talk about. <coughs> Someone I knew touched me on a private part of my body. 
and I had to remember the protect yourself rules. It doesn't matter who it is. If anyone touches you on a private part, you have to shout, run, and tell, no matter what. It's not fair, because addiction got a hold of my mom and dad. Now they're hooked. They fight all the time, and they don't spend much time with me. Miss Light, I don't want to talk about my family anymore. I understand, but it helps to talk with others who understand what you're going through. Even if your parents are hooked, you need to stay safe and talk to people who can help you. You need to be a kid and laugh and play every day. D? There are kids who don't get to have lunch every day, and sometimes breakfast or dinner either. Wow, that sounds horrible. My mom told me that the Stamp Out Hunger food drive is on Saturday, May 9th. She said it gets food to families who need it. Can I help? Of course. On May 9th, place a bag of non-perishable food at your mailbox. Thank you. Thank you. So now imagine you're a, you're a child in a classroom, and you're thinking the cartoon characters are real, and you actually have the opportunity to talk to your characters. So we formed a partnership with Skype in the classroom, and my genius business partner, Rudy Verbeek, has created a technology that gives us the ability to have our cartoon characters dial up a classroom or an auditorium on Skype and talk directly to the kids, and I'm going to let you experience that right now. So let's, uh, let's meet Maria. Maria? Hi, Terry. I'm coming. Hey. Hi, Maria. Hi, everybody. Your friend Ken is here. Can you see Ken? I can. Hi, Ken. Hi, Maria. How are you? I'm doing great. So is there anybody here that you'd like to introduce to Maria? Yes, a surprise <laughs> person next to me. So would you like to tell Maria your name? Hi, Maria. I'm Tina. <gasps> Hi, Tina. <laughs> I like your long hair. Oh. It looks like you could probably braid it into a lot of really cool things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, do you want to play a game with me? Sure. <gasps> oh, actually, do you all want to play a game with me? Okay. I don't know. Does it sound like it? I Come said you want to play a game. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Woohoo! Okay. This game is called Do What I Do. I'll do a move, and then you all do it with me. Okay? Do you want them to stand up, Maria? You bet I do. Okay, stand everyone, up. stand up. Selecting our really strong muscles. Mm. Look at all those strong muscles. Ooh, I see somebody in the front. You must work out a lot. <laughs> now show me your best dance moves. <laughs> wow, I see some disco, the robot. <laughs> And raise your arms like they're really tall trees. Oh. <laughs> Good job. You can sit down. Okay. Good job. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. You did a great job. You can imagine how much fun it is for a child to participate this way, right, in the classroom? Because Maria can see you, and she can hear you, and she's one with you. Well, um, Maria, I guess it's time for dinner, right? Yeah. Thanks for playing with me, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. <laughs> <laughs> so we are pioneering and changing the way we use animation. We are changing the way we produce characters. We're telling, changing the way we tell stories. We're changing the way we deliver technology. And we're also now actually giving our software, our library of animations, 
and the ability to teach and create animation to schools across America, to teach them to make their own stories and interpret the 16 habits of mind, and we'll put them on YouTube and share them with other students across America. So we have five districts that we're working with now, one in Snohomish, Washington, yay. And one in uh, the Charles Weiss School in Miami, Florida, on Effingham, Illinois, Andover, Kansas, and in um, uh, Columbus, Mississippi. They're actually using it with their elementary school kids and their middle school kids. They're actually using our software and our characters, and they're making their own cartoons, and we're teaching them how to do that. So we're excited about it, and we're looking for the storytellers of the future, which is why we're giving it away to these students. And it's my hope that these storytellers of the future will create the same kind of emotional impact that I had when I experienced my film at 12 and that we're making on children today. Thank you.